Okay, everyone. Welcome back to For the Girls, What a Race. We say what a race every time we open an episode in the past two months, but what a race, where to even begin. We had an Oscar made and win, a McLaren 1-2 max points situation with extremely dramatic team orders, some Max Lewis contact, which I think kind of flew under the radar. Lewis's 200th podium also flew under the radar. Checko out in Q1, so much more, lots to talk about. And at this point now, we have seven race winners this season seven race winners. It's just unbelievable to say. And only one race left until summer break and silly season. So lots to chat about. We'll jump right in. I'm Chessa. I'm Tiggy. And I'm Sarah. (laughs) Jumping into our overall thoughts and takeaways. This was such a thrilling race when for the first 40-ish laps, it did not seem like it was going to be mega exciting. It looked like it was going to be super exciting for Oscar's maiden win, but it didn't look super eventful in terms of wheel wheel action or team orders. And then that McLaren situation was truly wild. I don't think we've seen a team orders situation play out to that level of radio drama and that level of overall eventfulness in a long time. I can't really think of in the past few seasons a good comparable situation. So that was extremely, extremely interesting. And we will definitely get into it. But overall, just so happy for Oscar. He really, really deserved it. Thrilled for him to get his maiden win and for the team to come away with such a huge points haul and to really make constructors exciting now. That gets into my second point, which I think this also and the McLaren success this weekend has huge ramifications for Checo. (laughs) Here's this tight now, and Red Bull cannot afford to have Checo's results that they've had recently. He has not had a podium since April in China, and since then his finishes have been P4, P8, DNF, DNF, P8, (sighs) P7, P17, P7. He's the only driver from the top four teams, so now Red Bull, McLaren, Ferrari, and Mercedes to not win a race this season because we have seven that, race winners. That's an amazing stat. Not to mention all the Q1 exits. Like It's not just like he's having bad luck during a race. He's literally not getting himself in a position with to a fast win. enough lap. to Yeah, totally. And I think we've talked about this a lot, but circumstances have really changed. If McLaren is able to get one-twos now – they can close that gap in constructors. So I personally think all of this is gearing up to Checo being replaced in August. I'm just going to open with with an extremely, extremely hot take. <laughs> well, we will obviously debate this and talk about this when we get to the teams, as well as all our thoughts on the McLaren situation, which I won't dive into in this section. But yeah, it was it was a wild race. And I was watching at Formula E in between the quali session and the race, which was kind of crazy and wild to trying to be listening to the radios because so much of this race was audio versus video. I felt like oh, I, was, <laughs> I was not paying attention a ton to what was happening on track besides the Max and Lewis battle and like the crazy defending and the the obviously the the contact, but yeah, I felt like so much of it was an audio race. So I was that like, is such a good point. <laughs> listening to this, I think, I mean, we'll talk more about the McLaren drama. I think part of it is growing pains a little bit when you're having, when you're in a position of being one, two for the first time in a very long time, it's hard. You have to get everything right. And I'm not making excuses for what happened today, but like strategy, team orders on the radio, how you actually operate when you're fully in the spotlight, like you are the team one, two in the spotlight and having this drama. I think we're seeing a little bit of those growing pains. And yeah, I definitely agree with the the Checo stuff. We'll talk about that more, but it just feels so fun to have F1 be as exciting as it is right now and hopefully many, many more races to come in the whole season. But I also have a hot take about Max, which I'll, I'll get to. <laughs> Ooh. Oh my God, I'm going to speed through my section now. I can't wait. <laughs> I echo everything you guys said. Of course, I've as from the beginning when we started this podcast, I've always had you know allegiances and drivers that I love, but my biggest sort of love of F1 overall is always the drama. And it's been really hard to be a fan for a while without having without with having, you know, Max and Red Bull constantly dominating. So this season has been such a treat. It just keeps getting better and better. And of course we'll hopefully see that happening. And to I love what you said about growing pains. I don't like I don't know if I would call it growing pains. I think McLaren is already such a good team. But I agree, like when was the last time 
because Checo hasn't been doing well, that we've consistently had one team, one, two all the time. You take it for granted when, you know, it's executed seamlessly, but it is a massive amount of work on the team to get both of those drivers one, two on podium without any drama. And you don't always see it behind the scenes. And I think that's an excellent point. And, you know, I think we'll continue to have, see McLaren in situations where they could get max points and be one, one, two all the time. And they'll, they'll hopefully work it out. I mean, this is like massive learning lessons from, from the first time. Remember every Sunday briefing, Chessa. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, Okay, um, MVPs. I got to give it to Oscar. How could you not? Ooh. It's his maiden win. I do feel bad that the sort of pure happy moment was robbed from him a little bit. Yeah. Like I think it would have been so much nicer for him and for everybody to just have that fully done on merit, no drama, no swapping positions. And if they had swapped positions, it would have been nice for Lando to have done that much earlier. So Either Lando could have taken it back on merit or Oscar could have just kind of sailed off into the distance, whatever was going to happen. But unfortunately, that's not what we got. But nonetheless, very happy for Oscar and just not only on his performance, but also his attitude. I think many drivers in that situation, we would have heard cursing on the radio, oh, freaking yeah. out, yeah. not having the level of calm that he did. And so I'm I'm proud of him for that. <laughs> if nothing else. I wonder – what we would have heard from Oscar's radio if Lando never gave the place back. Honestly, probably the same thing. <laughs> like, sorry, and there guys. you go. <laughs> yeah. He is so calm, cool, and collected. I definitely agree on Oscar MVP. We've been so excited for him to get his maiden win. It's extremely well deserved. It's only his second season in F1, and he drives like on a level of people who have been in F1 for seven, eight years, driven for multiple teams, had a lot more experience than him. And his composure truly is incredible. He's done a great job of playing the team game both last season and this season. There's been plenty of times when he swapped because Lando was faster or on better strategy or just because the team told him to. He's been – he really has been a team player, and I'm happy to see that really pay off for him. Not only a team player, but also he's an incredible talent. His start, being able to yeah. get – being able to get that start done when it was three wide in turn one was, yeah. was extremely impressive. Amazing. Um, my MVP, of course, it's going to be Oscar, but to, to have something different, obviously Lewis, because he got his 200th podium. Way to go, Lewis. And Nicole Piastri. Killing her, it. Her content, she posted a picture of her like kicking her leg up at the screen, like all excited and being like, well, there goes my 6 a.m. Pilates class, like <laughs> staying up all night. <laughs> and also she was in an Oscar Piastri Eras Tour t-shirt, which she definitely got on Etsy and is definitely not sanctioned by, by <laughs> McLaren or Formula One as official merch, but I love that. Or Taylor her. Swift. <laughs> or Taylor Red, Swift. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay. LVPs. Lando is a very obvious LVP just for his sort of unsportsmanship like behavior to say the least. And then my consistent LVP, which is so sad, is Checo. He's just going to get a permanent spot in my LVPs until he can regain some semblance of performance. Mine's similar. I have to go within the McLaren pit wall. I think I kind of not blame Lando less, but he was basically put in an impossible position. Both drivers were put in an impossible position, I think, by the strategy call. And so I think not realizing the strength of the undercut when we had seen it on track, Max had just been grievously undercut by both Charles and Hamilton, which he was extremely upset about. You could see it playing out on track. So to make the active decision to pit Lando first, to keep Oscar out for multiple additional laps, not realize the impact that would have or realizing it and thinking that Lando would just give it back. No comment. It just seemed like it was just a really, really unfortunate series of events. Yeah. Yeah. I fully agree. I'm sure we'll talk more about the the McLaren stuff and debate that, but I, I sort of agree. I actually don't think Lando, I, un, I understand why Lando felt the way he, he did. Yeah, uh, exactly. And I think exactly. McLaren should not have put them in that position. Granted, Lando will hopefully learn from this and realize that being silent on your radio for like 20 laps and pretending not to hear the team is not a good look for anyone because you have this team basically begging you over the radio to like remember your Sunday morning briefings and you don't win a championship on your own. Like that's not fun to air out that laundry it's kind of awkward. publicly. So yeah. it's kind of awkward for everyone. But my LVP is... Well, I guess I enjoyed the drama, but Max and GP's radios <laughs> were just so 
uncomfortable to me. Max kind of was, he was throwing a fit, to be honest. And I think GP, GP called him childish, which you, I feel like we don't hear on the radio very often. And I fully understand Max's frustration. He was not happy with the car. He felt like, you know, Lewis wasn't driving in the way that he should, whatever. But I just, those radios were pretty brutal. And getting to my Max hot take, I think Max will quit F1 before 2026 starts. I think he will be out. <laughs> that is freaking insane. But you said it. And if it happens. I said it. Wow. That is, I think, the hottest take that has ever been stated on this podcast. Wait, I need, I need to hear more. Next for 2025. Before 2026. Oh, I think okay. Red Bull car next year is not going to be very good. And I think this race proved that Max does not have fun and does not want to race in F1 if he is not at He's the top. not winning. Yeah. That's my thought. <laughs> There's a difference. I do think Max has relish. You've been able to see, I feel like he rises to a challenge so well. And so he was the underdog for years. And you can see even in the past couple seasons, whenever he's had a bad quality, say starting P14 and winning, and you can tell he's almost happier those wins that he had to work so hard for it. I think this was a combination of being super frustrated with the car, feeling like strategy really was not going well. I think it was kind of a, a culmination of events that that made him so upset feeling that the team wasn't listening to him and wasn't making the right decisions. But I do think it's definitely interesting that Max compared to other drivers has definitely made comments of, Oh, I don't, this lifestyle is a big sacrifice. I don't really know if I want to do this forever. So I do, I do see where Tiggy's coming from, but I think, I think he still does have fun, even if he's not in P1. <laughs> I think the difference between earlier in his career and the past couple seasons where he did have to fight, like I totally agree that he relishes a challenge, but I think it's different at the beginning of your career when you're making a name for yourself. I yeah. think it's a lot harder to come from where you come as whatever, a three-time world champion and then go downhill again. And I also think Red Bull has delivered him a car in the past few seasons, even when, except for Singapore last year, even when he qualifies P14 or whatever it is for some crazy reason, he has the car to fight back. Now, if every other car has caught up and next year he's like having to languish in mid <laughs> field, which you imagine that's a hot take that Red Bull is going to be in the midfield. But if other cars are catching up and Max is not comfortably on in podium position, I do think it's going to be tough for him. It reminds me of actually something Lewis said. I think it was on his Hot Ones interview, which I watched after Tiggy had said it was super good. And he got asked if he prefers to be fighting as the underdog or as the top dog at the top spot. And he said he prefers underdog because no one realizes how hard it is to be yeah. at the top. And once you have that expectation on you of, oh, not winning is not considered a great weekend or isn't considered doing well, that that is – is much harder. So yeah, him and, and Lewis gives me have a chat. A ton of respect for Lewis, who arguably came off one of the highest highs of F1's yeah, history, ever. having Abu Dhabi 2021 happen to him and then still stick it out. It's just pretty crazy. Totally. And I hope Max does that. I mean, I don't hope Abu Dhabi on 2021 on Max, obviously, but like, I hope that if we see him struggle with a car, that's not good. He does stick it out because he's an amazing driver, but today didn't give me a lot of optimism for that. I mean, it's the first, it's like the first time in a long time that he's just not been fighting for podium or like can't just can't get there. And I think the frustration is real, but maybe it'll sink in and he'll get used to it and it'll really ignite some sort of fire for him to come back to the top. But I like We're that. getting ahead of ourselves. This plays into my, into my hot take for Belgium, but we can, Ooh. we can wait for that. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's talk about our hot takes from this weekend. I will go first. <laughs> okay. I think this is two in a row for me. I said Lewis, or what did I say? Lewis win last time. And then this time I said all McLaren Mercedes podium. And that came true. Job. And at the time I was like, this is going to be a really hot take. <laughs> Which Good I'm job. Very wow. About. I'm very impressed. And I will also say when I posted the Nico Rosberg thing today <laughs> and I said in the story I was like Oscar maiden win question mark question mark question mark it's kind of a double hours so take. maybe what you just said about Max is going to be true <laughs> I'm feeling like an F1 sage at the moment <laughs> Nico Rosberg has never jinxed anything so hard in his entire life that just the selfie the shout out to Lando just oh man. and then Girl. having him do the post race interviews too was just so <laughs> so good um, okay, Sarah, how was your hot take? I had a Ferrari podium, so quite bad. They 
they had a, had a had a decent weekend, but they were never really in in podium contention. I had two McLarens on podium as well, and then a wild card, and then I could have just left it at a wild card, and then my hot take would have won. But then you guys made me clarify, and I said George. I know <laughs> you're calling you're calling Lewis a wild card on podium. <laughs> well, honestly, at this point, I shouldn't. But like to me, a wild card used to be anyone that wasn't Max on podium. <laughs> When I heard wild card, I was like Nico Hulkenberg. Yeah. <laughs> <Morgan Sargent. absolutely. laughs> uh, maybe Max is a wild card on podium now. No, Guys. no, too soon. How the mighty have fallen. Okay, let's jump into the race weekend. So practice highlights. We had some big upgrades across the board, big ones for Steak, for Aston Martin, and big ones for Red Bull. So practice time was super important for these teams. It was the start of a very, very hot weekend coming off of a very, very wet week. Temperatures over 30 Celsius, so about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. FP1, the Ferraris looked really strong. And then in FP2, the main story here was that Charles had a big crash that brought out the red flags. Thankfully, he was okay. And miraculously, the car was in pretty good shape as as well for the extent of the impact. The amount of G-force triggered the sensors that make it required for the driver to get picked up by the medical car. So pretty scary crash, but everything seemed okay at the end. And then FP3, that was pretty indicative of what we were going to see for the rest of the weekend. We had a McLaren 1-2. For Quali, this started off the extremely eventful Saturday and Sunday we had here. We had two red flags caused by two different drivers in the Red Bull family. So quite the start. In Q1, the conditions were really tough because it had been raining just before the session began. So there were still damp spots on the track, but everyone still went out on slicks. The first crazy event here was with almost seven minutes left. So again, just like Silverstone, a lot of time left in the session. Checo lost it, had a big impact that caused a red flag. In his defense, I will say it was mixed conditions. He probably hit a damp spot, but still just cannot be happening, especially not two weekends in a row. And then meanwhile, it was a rough session for George. He didn't set as good of a first lap as he would have wanted. And then the team made a mistake and didn't give him enough fuel to do his final flying so lap. So. Toto was brutal about that after quality. He was just like, <laughs> we cannot afford to be making these mistakes. And whatever Toto phrase he said, it was not not pretty. <laughs> and so for cuts, we had Checo, George, Joe, Ocon, and Gasly, the start of A. Also tough weekend for the Alpines. Ugh, Alpines. <laughs> so I'm sad. Gotten there yet. Rip. Q2. Both <laughs> Williams made it into Q2. So that was at least exciting. Lewis and Bono sometimes give me heart attacks during qualifying. <laughs> and it always do. seems to work out. They just <laughs> like to give you some excitement. <laughs> they do. Lewis was so close to being cut. He did make it into Q3, but by one hundredth of a second. I'm like, oh my God. Help. Come on now. <laughs> so we ended up for cuts having Nico Hulkenberg, Botas, Albon, Sargent, and K Mag. So no big surprises there. For Q3, the we had both Aston Martins and both V carbs in Q3. Like if you were if you were just tuning in for Q3, you would like look at it and be like, oh my god, what? Checo out, so surprised. And then you would be like, <laughs> Aston Martins and V carbs in Q3, crazy. So on the first flying runs, Lando had provisional pole. Oscar looked really strong as well. And then with only two minutes on the clock left, Yuki had a pretty big crash at turn five. He like skid all the way down across the barriers. Very similar to Checo and Charles's crashes. He had to head back in the medical car, but he was okay. And then since that was such a tight amount of time, it left such a tight amount of time. It was really hard for everyone to get another flying lap in after the red flag. Everyone was able to, except for signs. And then in the chaos and some mixed conditions with rain, um, everyone, no one really improved their time. So we had a Lando pole, which was super exciting. Oscar P2, Max P3, signs P4, Leclerc P5. And then we had Hamilton, Alonso, Stroll, and Ricardo. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning F1 championships is sometimes also what you need to keep your car running day in and day out. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home some huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. 
for the race. So some overall highlights, I guess, in the radio of the week. Wow, this race was just crazy. Like we talked about, we talked about the jinxes. <laughs> and then Chessa, I think 40 laps in, said that the race wasn't exciting. I think this was me in Austria or something when I said the same thing. And then we just get treated. <laughs> we have to keep saying that because I think yeah. like around like between lap 35 and 45, someone's got to come in and be like, oh, guys, I'm so bored. What's going on? And then <laughs> boom, it gets exciting. So you're welcome. Yes. So let's start with the start and then we'll walk you through kind of the infamous McLaren undercut debacle and then the Max Lewis contact, which were sort of the main highlights of the race. So there was also some pre-race action with Lando's throttle having issues, but they were able to fix it just in time, which I guess is good. (laughs) (laughs) But for the start, so this can be a two to three stop race. So there were a lot of different choices on tire strategy. Most started on mediums, but we did have some on softs and some on hards. Lando did have a good start. It looked like he would be able to enter turn one ahead of both Oscar and Max, but then both of them launched up and it was three wide going into turn one, Oscar on the inside, then Lando and Max on the outside. So everyone was squeezed. Lando had nowhere to go on the right. So he pushed Max off to the left. Max then rejoined ahead of Lando, so there was a little bit of a back and forth about whether to give the position back for gaining an off-track advantage. Max, that was kind of the first (laughs) foreshadowing of Max being upset about that. Max was upset about that, did not know that Lando had Oscar on the inside and nowhere to go, so then the team did tell Max to give the place back, and meanwhile, Oscar just started pulling a multi-second gap up front. Then we get to the McLaren team orders. So this was really the highlight of the race or at the low light, I suppose. But the background (laughs) is important here. Oscar had a great first stint by lap 14. He was over three seconds ahead of Lando in P2. Lando was told, interestingly, that his race was with Max, not Oscar. So it seemed like everyone was kind of thinking that Oscar had the pace and would go the distance. On lap 33, Oscar did have a bit of an error. He had a trip through the gravel and lost some time, but he did maintain his lead. And then on lap 46, and as we said, at this point, it was clear that the undercut was very powerful from what had already been happening on track. McLaren made the choice to pit Lando first instead of Oscar. So basically giving Lando the undercut on his own teammate. They told Oscar on the radio that this was for Lando to cover Hamilton, but Lando really wasn't under pressure from Hamilton at all. I feel like you can tell that something has gone wrong when all the commentators on both Sky Sports and on F1 TV are kind of unanimous in saying what What? on earth is going on here. Everyone was just so confused. Oscar got kept out for another two full laps. And again, you know how strong the undercut is even adding on that second lap is just losing him more time. So then Oscar pitted his stop was just slightly slower, but regardless he reemerged from the pits and came out behind Lando. So that was unfortunate. We were like all at the edge of our seats, but I think, yeah, like Sarah said, the second that we saw him out for that extra lap, we kind of knew. And then the team went on the radio and said, quote, we'd like to reestablish the order at your convenience, end quote, which is like, I know, <laughs> whose convenience is what? <laughs> Oscar was pushing super hard right when he got out, realized he was behind Lando, hadn't yet been told about the swap back. And then he had a little, another little trip through the gravel that maybe wouldn't have been happened, that maybe wouldn't have happened if he had been told. But again, he didn't know. What happened was when Lando was told to get the place back at his convenience, and it clearly wasn't convenient, <laughs> he ignored this. And literally, like we said earlier, ignored several messages on the radio to the point where McLaren had to say radio check to see if it was even working or if it was broken. So awkward. And while all that was happening, Lando was basically just pedaled to the metal, pulling out a huge gap, even though he had immediately been told to swap. So literally, don't pull a gap, let him pass. And I think kind of just like proving the point that maybe he thought it was a bad idea. It wasn't happy with the decision. It was, it was wild. So he pulled a three second gap at this point. Oscar was told that once the gap got smaller, they would do the swap. Lando, meanwhile, literally not caring, continued to push as hard as possible. I think the gap got up to five or six seconds at one point. It was six. It was over six seconds. And Lando, at one point, when he finally got back on the radio, he was like, well, tell him to catch up then. (laughs) Are you kidding? 
Yeah. yeah. I, I, I imagine poor Oscar is like just doing what he's told he, and he's like, okay, Lando will slow down and then I'll be able to pass. And he's like, Lando, where are you going? <laughs> and I guess in the McLaren pit walls defense here, I guess as soon as they maybe realized, say the undercut was an error and they hadn't realized it would be so powerful. They didn't realize Lando would come out in front or maybe they were really worried about Hamilton, but they thought, okay, we'll just pit Lando and then tell them to swap immediately. No harm, no foul. There's 25 laps left, however, however much was left. And so I guess if they thought maybe that Lando would switch immediately upon getting out of the pits, there this whole situation yeah. would have been avoided. So it's almost the pit wall decision and then the Lando decision to ignore them that then just Created absolutely cascaded. But it's I did Andrea Stella ever come on the radio? Because I was almost no. waiting for him to come on and just be like, let's make this happen. Zach probably would have, but he was in Toronto with the indie team. So, And someone said that. They were like, too bad Zach's not here this weekend. <laughs> yeah. Could, they should have the passed Zach fighting. from IndyCar. <laughs> oh, my God. Imagine like they, he just dialed in from a different oh, angle. <laughs> <laughs> but Lando, meanwhile, like we said, kind of continued to push as hard as possible. And that's when his engineer started sending over a series of increasingly stressed and kind of upset messages. Like, I know you'll do the right thing. I'm trying to protect you. Remember every single Sunday morning meeting we have. And then the final message with five laps left. There are five laps to go. The way to win a championship is not by yourself. It is with the team. You're going to need Oscar and you are going to need the team. Mike, drop. <laughs> it turned into like inspirational statements in an extremely stressed voice. You could tell the engineer was like, oh my God, I don't know if he's going to What do listen. I say? Well, I so don't have the training for this. <laughs> I like, this is like kind of threatening. And on, on F1 TV, they were like, wow, that's basically th- as threatening as you can get with, without being like, yo, if you do this, like you're not going to be on the team anymore. So everyone was pretty shocked. It was very, very intense. David Coulthard did say he was like they would yeah. never threaten to right. sack. Right. I think they it was the word sack sack him because he's sort of their golden boy and he is their their future in in many respects. But yeah, I, when I heard this message, my my jaw was on the floor. It was interesting too, David Coulthard, and hearing the commentators were amazing during this. And David Coulthard so was giving good. the racers perspective where he was basically saying, "You can't put a driver in this position because." It's in their DNA yeah. to win. They're never going to want to give up a place to a teammate. And so you just need to avoid this situation as much as possible. He was saying also that David was saying that he essentially regretted having given a place up once to, I think it was Mika Heikkinen. And David said, similarly, he got a message on the radio, which was an empty threat that he interpreted as kind of, you'll be fired. It was something like your, your standing in the team will be questioned. And David in hindsight was like, I wish I hadn't listened. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, not wow. in sort of Lando's defense, I still think he could have handled this better, but Lando also only has one win. Now he and Oscar have the same Are, amount of wins. Yeah. And yeah, if Lando is the next to to beat Max in the championship, he's the next in line after Max. And what if he loses the championship by like a few points, you know? It's okay, just- so- this is a question that we got. I want to hear your perspective. So a lot of people DM'd us and said, a lot of people were like, oh my God, I'm so happy that Oscar won and like he deserved it, whatever. And of course he did. But when realistically Max and, and Lando could be fighting for the championship, why would McLaren risk not getting Lando these extra points? Is it because they don't actually think that Lando and Mac, that Lando could take the championship from Max and they're more concerned with just constructors. And in that case, like let's let Oscar get his first win what was the the thinking there, you guys think? It's so hard. I think part of it is, and this is going to sound PR-y probably, but <laughs> <laughs> I think McLaren really is trying to cultivate a team spirit and a team vibe, and we do everything as good sports yeah. and as teammates, and we win as one, and this is what's fair in our minds for this race. And maybe that's too optimistic or naive to think that a team would think in that way. But I I kind of agree. I don't see any other reason why they would tell Lando, who was P2 in the championship, to swap positions with his teammate who's six seconds behind him, other than the fact that it was the right thing to do. I just I just don't buy that a team, if they think that their driver could be be number one in the championship – would ever risk him getting points. So I think there is still kind of a big gap. So, you know, I, I don't think it's as 
palpable and obvious. I don't think it's obvious enough now that Lando could be beating Max. But at the same time, they have to believe that they have a shot at winning. I mean, we're only halfway through the season, you know? I think I think I agree with you that I think they see constructors within reach, in which case really the team working together and both drivers being happy is the priority. I think they have never really viewed this season as their season to take the title from Max. I think they're setting up for next season. But I also think it's hard because here we ended up with somehow a maximum points haul and two extremely unhappy drivers. They were putting on a brave face at the end, but I think they were both probably understandably so very upset for different reasons. So I almost think it might have just been a situation where there was a mistake with the pick call and the undercut and then just a series of quick reactions that kind of cascaded together. Because again, I think the visuals and the result would have been way worse if Lando had immediately complied. And as one of you said earlier, Lando maybe would have caught him on track in the last stint. Mm -hmm. And again, it would have avoided all of this. And so I think it was almost a series of unfortunate events where the decisions kept stacking and Mm -hmm. it kept getting worse and worse. And so I don't know if it, if they had the time or the thought to kind of make the decision of are we prioritizing Lando's championship points And to Tiki's point earlier about growing pains, that's also a great point because those are the types of discussions if you're running in one, two, you need to have of like, do we prioritize what we see as equity in the race or do we prioritize championship points no matter what and always prioritize the driver who's ahead in the championship, which kind of has its own pros and cons at different points. Wow. Guys, gr- that's a very interesting conversation topic right there. I love that. That was great. I love listening to you guys talk. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just gushing. Like we have a podcast or something. <laughs> that was awesome. Wow. Okay. I just had a moment there. Okay. So to, to wrap that up before we talk about the rest of the, the race. So Lando, as we know, eventually let him through at the 11th hour and said, quote, he had nothing to say. He goes, I have nothing to say. And in the post-race interview that he just complied with team orders, both were putting on a happy face like Sarah said, but it was incredibly awkward. Yikes. Well, let's talk about the other moment in the race, the non-McLaren moment, the Max and Lewis, we are back to 2021 moment. So (laughs) Max was not having fun out there today, even with all of the big Red Bull upgrades to the bodywork, side pods, the car just wasn't working well and he was not happy with it. He was Also, like we said, super upset on the radio about the team not realizing that he would be undercut by Lewis and Charles around lap 40. So he came out behind them in P5, but then he was pushing super hard despite being told to save his tires, which is a trend between him and GP. And when GP (laughs) commented on this, Max got really upset on the radio about the undercut, swearing, you screwed me on the strategy, that whole thing. And then Max was in fight mode, got past Charles, then had a battle with Lewis, and he did have a nice kind of pass of Lewis on the outside, but then Lewis got him back, tried to go on the inside at turn one, which then ended in contact. So Max was on the inside of that. It was definitely aggressive, and he braked late, locked up, and then Lewis was on the outside and turned in a bit. And I think the announcers were like, yeah, Lewis maybe turned in a little bit early but at the same time like max's lockup definitely didn't help and yeah it ended with max kind of his rear wheels in the air and then falling back a couple of places i'm glad he was able to finish a dnf would have just been tough for morale after all of that but i do i do think lewis turned in a bit i think this was probably a racing incident but i think then if we go back a couple weeks to the max lando contact in austria i think if we're gonna call this a racing incident then Max, what was it? Was it a five or 10 second penalty? I think that's unfair then because I think that was about kind of the same level of contact and, oh, inside, outside, arguably ahead at the apex at the inside, a little bit of a squeeze on the outside. I don't see a ton of difference there. And so I get why. And I haven't seen Max's post-race comments yet. I'm sure Max will say something about this or will feel upset if there was no penalty for that. And then he got not only the penalty in Austria, but also so much public grievance for like a week (laughs) after when I think that was probably also just a racing incident. Yeah. (laughs) It's also hard like as a spectator to feel certain ways about is it a racing incident versus does it deserve a penalty when it looks kind of dramatic. Like seeing the rear wheels up and then land like that where you're sure he would have damage is obviously dramatic. And and like same with, for example, like Checo in in Monaco. Like that was so gnarly and the, the public has such a reaction 
And it sometimes I imagine would be hard for the FIA to see like some actual physical drama playing out versus just being like purely on like the physics of where the car was going, what happened. That's so, so true. Four teams. Let's start with Red Bull. Tough weekend overall, as we've sort of alluded to. We had Checo with his second consecutive wreck in Q1. He did at least recover to some points in P7, but really just not a good look. And we discussed a little bit about <laughs> what his future is holding, but we'll get to that in a second. Max finished P5 after struggling with the car all race, fighting with GP on the radio, the contact with Hamilton. And this does kind of come at the worst possible time with McLaren surging to the front of the field, a huge points haul. Max does still have a sizable driver's championship lead with 265 while Lando has 189. But now Red Bull has 389 in constructors and McLaren has 338. That's only 51 points behind, theoretically two races or potentially one. So what does this mean for Checo? Because really Checo is the the weak link here and he's not delivering the points that they need in the constructors championship. So what do you all think? Sarah, we heard at the beginning, I think you think he's gone after spa and in silly season. It's crazy. Yeah. If there was a clause in his re-signing that he had to do the job of a number two driver or else that clause will be activated shortly. Yeah. I think there must have been a clause and that would explain a lot of why it was a two year deal, which felt Long. I think a lot of people were surprised by. I remember we had done a poll on Instagram and a lot of people said, wow, I'm I'm surprised it was a two-year deal. So that would make a lot of sense. And I think you just see the difference here of when you have Oscar as a number two versus Checo and Oscar is bringing in absolutely huge points hauls. He's driving amazingly. And that's what Red Bull is going to need the rest of the season. Tiggy, what do you think? Yeah, I sort of agree. I just don't see how – they justify sticking with Checo given this performance. It's, it's not just like one or two races. This is consistently bad performance now. And I wonder if the Verstappens have as much sway as they seem to in the Red Bull organization. I do think that they won't sign someone like Carlos. But I sort of feel like if you're Red Bull and you're looking at Checo versus Carlos and you're thinking about points and performance, like I would go with Carlos. I just worry that it might upset the apple cart a little bit in terms of F1 that. is all about knocking that apple cart over <laughs> let them spill and I do think Max ultimately is about winning and I think he feels like he could beat Carlos on merit in the Red Bull and I think for Max at this point he's like yeah I want to get a toe in Q3 I want someone to be yeah. starting front row and able to defend the cars behind me he's probably sick of having to do everything alone and he's able to handle it really well. But the added pressure of when you're the only car up front every week, every weekend, you're the only one mm -hmm. fighting for podiums, fighting for wins. And now that it's more competitive, he would probably be happy to have that help. Honestly, the type of help Checo provided in the 2021 season yeah. with some of the defense he was able to pull on Hamilton is what Max is going to need. I'm so and nostalgic I, for 2021 Checo <laughs> master of defense. It is also making it look – Super, super, super smart that Carlos has waited. I was as just going to say possible. that. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a ton of sense why he would be waiting. But it also, like we said last episode, Red Bull can't afford to delay too long because they're going to lose their options if they, if they don't make a decision quickly. So, okay. Next question in terms of who the options are out of the Red Bull organization, out of Yuki, Danny, and Liam Lawson, are any of them potentials for maybe not a multi-year deal, but just the second half of the season if Checo were to get replaced? And they don't put, oh, mid-season? I would put Yuki in that seat. I would put Yuki in that seat for the last six months. And I would and put Carlos. back in the V-carb for, for next year. <laughs> it's the same organization. Yeah, I would probably try out Yuki for six months and sign Carlos for 2025. I think if Red Bull is really going to be pinching pennies down to the dollar of those last final points to get constructors, then I think Yuki would be better. But I almost think it would be so fun to see Liam in there. <laughs> but I'm going to say Danny. 
Sarah, I'm, what? I know. I'm, I'm such a broken record on this. I guess I just need to be proved wrong one final time by seeing him back in the <laughs> Red Bull final on track. Time. Just the most high stakes, the most high stakes Wait, end of the season. We forgot to talk about our quali chat. Okay, so we were talking about this and Yuki has this big wreck <laughs> and I had to watch quali later. And so I just get a, a text from Sarah that's like, Danny is the goat. And I was like, oh my God, what happened? Did he like get pull? Like what's going on? He did make it to Q3, but no, it was just, he looks good because Yuki wrecked himself. And Checo. Well, I was like, okay, Danny has made it through standing. And in my defense, I think I had sent that when Danny had set the fastest time in Q3 and Checo had wrecked in Q, sorry, in Q1. Danny set the fastest time and Checo wrecked. I was like, let's go, Danny. Full steam ahead. I'm sad. I, I love it, but I was like, I was I'm, like, the I'm, bar is so low. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep going through the teams here. Uh, Ferrari had a pretty decent points haul considering some issues in practice and quality. P4 for Charles, P6 for Carlos. Carlos dropped to P7 off the line, which hurt, kind of hurt the rest of his race. But overall, I think Ferrari was happy with their pace compared to Red Bull and Mercedes. And I think the one thing that's exciting is they lasted really long on their first stint on mediums, which has been something that they've really struggled with, with tire deg. So great sign for them and all that's to come. For Mercedes, 200th podium for Lewis, the first driver in history to reach that. I absolutely love the ESPN meme of Lewis sitting at dinner by himself. It's the caption, Lewis eating dinner with all of the people who have had 200 podiums in F1. <laughs> also, just so nice to see the momentum after his incredible win at Silverstone, another record-breaking weekend. So he was very happy, in a great mood, in the cool-down room, which was pretty funny. He probably did not know at that point that the vibe of McLaren was not ideal. <laughs> and someone should have warned him. <laughs> I was going to give Lando a shout-out on my LVP for this because – it, I felt so bad for Lewis. He was just trying to lighten the mood. He's like, man, you guys have a fast car. And Lando is like, you guys had a fast car for seven years. And Lewis was like, seven years ago, that's a long time. Like, were you even around for that? And Lando then was like, what did he say? He was like, yeah, well, you guys had that for a long time. So now it's our turn. And Lewis was like, I wasn't trying to complain. I was just complimenting your car, man. <laughs> Yeah, Lewis is like, I'm just trying to make conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so awkward. I was in, really annoyed at Lando for this. <laughs> oh, my God. You can't fault anyone for what they say in the cooldown room, though. It's just like the weirdest concept. Why do they have it? So it's awkward. So confusing. <laughs> I still think back to that plushy red throne that they put Max in that one time. How about the cooldown car in Vegas? In Vegas. Which the car? <laughs> Where they didn't fit in the backseat. They were all smushed in. It's so <laughs> awkward. Anyway, for George, it was P8. He did make up an impressive nine places in the race, but he started in P17 after his Q1 exit. So I think he was pretty disappointed in the weekend overall and said that the team needed to evaluate how that quality mistake could have happened and hopefully be avoided in the future. Really rare mistake from Mercedes, I feel like. For McLaren, we've already discussed them a lot, but overall, I just need to say an insane result. It's their first one-two since Monza in 2021. So ultimately, no matter how they got there, massive, massive points haul and really great for constructors. Both drivers also, in another shout out to them, they were really professional after the race besides Lando and Lewis's maybe little exchange there. They both were gracious. I think Lando pulled it together really quickly when a lot of people would not have been polite at all in in the interview. So hopefully they can learn from this, move forward quickly, just some growing pains, but so exciting to have that one too. For Aston Martin, a bit of a frustrating P10, P11 finish outside the points. We did see Stroll ahead of Alonso, which was great and interesting. I think both drivers were upset with the strategy choices. Alonso said that they pitted too early, but is excited about their upgrades, which they brought big ones this weekend to see what they'll bring um, going forward. For V-Carb, P9, and points for Yuki, I think he was really happy with that after the mechanics had to work overnight to fix the, the car that he crashed out. And the team acknowledged that they made a mistake with Danny's strategy. I think this is – they pitted him super early and sent him back out straight into heavy traffic. This was unfortunate. He had a – after a strong quality and he finished P12, and he was definitely not happy, but probably also not surprised. Yeah, big shout-out to Yuki, especially. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, big shout out to Yuki, especially. He was 
what put on what essentially felt like concussion watch after his really big quality crash. He was ex- he was instructed to just like stay at home and rest. I don't know if it was like in a dark room and don't talk to anyone, but it definitely was a big crash. So to turn that around, super impressive. For Alpine, devastating weekend for them, P19 and P20 in quali, and then just disaster in the race for Gasly. Gasly DNF'd in Silverstone with car problems after the team had replaced a bunch of engine components, his infamous 50-place grid penalty. (laughs) And then again here, Gasly started from the pit lane after making power unit changes and again had to retire with the suspected hydraulic leak. So just brutal. And then Ocon finished P18, so not really much better, to be honest. In this context, it was so interesting. One of those things we kind of take for granted that I hadn't thought about was my dad was asking, oh, say after quali, after a quality crash like Yuki's and they have to fix the car or they're switching engine components, do they get to test before the race whether or not it works? I said, <laughs> wow, that's an excellent point. Actually, no. They just have to send it out on the lap to the grid and on the formation lap and hope and that pray. it works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For stake, we had P16 and P19 for Botas and Joe. Still no points, but both drivers and the teams are maintaining relatively positive, positive about the upgrades that Botas got to his car this weekend. For Haas, no points, 13 and 15. Hulkenberg lost four places on the first lap from 11th to 15th. So he made up some ground to P13, but definitely not a lot that he could have done. And then to wrap up the teams, Williams. We had Albon finishing P14, Logan P17. Not huge problems for them, but they lost out a bit on the complex tire calls and ended up needing to do a three-stop race after pinning pretty early. Brutal. For standings, for the driver's standings, we have Max with 265. Lando with 189, Charles with 162, Sainz with 154, and Oscar with 149. Notably, Checo is in seventh. He's behind Lewis with 125, and then Checo has 124. And then four constructors, Red Bull has 389, and McLaren has 338. So getting a bit close. Ferrari is also very close behind with 322. Mercedes is at 241, and Aston Martin is at 69. For some really quick news, Haas announced that K-Mag will not be rejoining the team next year. Who do we think will get his seat? Will K-Mag go elsewhere? What's next? My thoughts, I think, is Ocon seems favored to get it. It seems like likely to be an Ocon-Berman pairing. And K-Mag, I have to say, I think he's leaving F1, although I have really enjoyed the memes of Stake could do something really cool, and it's like Hulkenberg (laughs) and K-Mag both in green. (laughs) There's an open seat at Stake. They could reunite. (laughs) I think Ocon is is a good pick. I would agree with that one. I would love to see Botas or Danny, assuming they don't have other seats, especially I just really want Botas to stay in F1. So we'll see, but I do think Ocon seems likely, and I think you all agreed in our poll that Ocon also seems most likely. Interestingly, in terms of speculation on the driver market front, Kimi Antonelli won his second race in F2 this weekend in Hungary, but he had quite the quote about his F1 future. He said, I don't know if I will be ready to be honest, and that he said he's still learning a lot in F2. So I'm sure Toto died a little hearing that. <laughs> well, part of me wonders if that's a PR plant. Like they've they're they've decided not to sign him, and so he's saying maybe just playing it as like, oh, I'm not ready yet. Maybe. Oh, okay, interesting. That's the Mercedes. Mercedes. <laughs> Mercedes. <laughs> exactly. All right, we'll give you a really quick spa preview. Spa, super famous in classic track. It offers so much. The drivers love it. It definitely has come under a lot of well-deserved criticism for safety reasons, especially the famous Eau rouge Radion combination, which we will talk about. Last year, this race was a sprint weekend, but this year it's just a regular race weekend and the last before silly season. In terms of some track and history background, the track is in eastern Belgium in the countryside. It's one of the most famous classic tracks. It's 44 laps, and the reason it's so short in terms of laps is because it's the longest lap on the F1 calendar. It's seven kilometers long. There's two DRS zones, and the lap record is still held by Botas from 2018. The most famous part of the circuit is the Uroge and Radion combination Tiki just mentioned, but it's also the most dangerous. And recently there's been some extremely tragic and fatal accidents in that area of the track. The French driver Antoine Hubert died in 2019 during an F2 race. And then last year, the Dutch driver Delano van Hoff died during a Formula Regional European Championship race. He was only 18 years old. And 
In particular, the Van Hoff accident last year happened in heavy rain, which can make the track and especially that Urosh Radion combination even more dangerous. So hopefully the FIA will be super cognizant of any potential safety issues if it's a rainy weekend. For last year's race, massive show of Max dominance. I'm sure he'll be looking to bring that back. He started P6, though he won by over 20 seconds. It was his eighth win in a row, and Checo came in P2. But after Max passed Checo on lap 17, Max made up almost a second a lap on Checo for the last of the race. So for the rest of that race. So that was just another really big showing of those huge gaps that Max used to be able to get or hopefully he still can get. Sorry, Sarah. Um, Charles <laughs> Charles rounded out the podium in P3, and then we had a P4 from Lewis and a P5 from Alonso. And this was interesting. It was a sprint. There was heavy rain, um, and we were happy to see that the FIA was pretty conservative on, on the safety front. The sprint started with several laps behind a safety car because everyone was on mandatory full wet tires. There was a traffic jam in the pit lane while everyone got onto inters. Um, and through all of that, we did have a moment where Oscar was winning the race. So it was very exciting. And so that sprint ended up being Max Look Piastri. Look at him now. Look at him now. <laughs> that sprint ended up being Max Piastri and Gasly. And it was great to see some new faces at that point of the season, um, even though it was just that sprint podium. A couple things to look out for for teams. So Red Bull, it will be another chance to test out the massive upgrade package they brought to Hungary, which we saw did not pay off there, but a different, a different track. It will definitely be an important race for them heading strong into silly season to solidify their P1 constructors standings. And like we've mentioned, this is make or break for Checo and they will be making a decision (laughs) over silly season, it seems. For Ferrari, it's another big race for Ferrari to establish themselves points-wise since they're only 16 points back from McLaren in constructors. And for some perspective on numbers, P3 is 15 points. So the margins are super tight here and Ferrari will be looking to come back from their kind of post-Monaco struggles. For Mercedes, after two really solid weekends of podium finishes for Hamilton and then an unfortunate weekend for George, I think he'll be wanting to come in super competitive, get another taste of a podium or a win. And then I think for McLaren, the big thing will just be if all all is well and if they can surpass those tensions from this weekend. For Aston Martin, they did bring a substantial upgrade to Hungary that didn't land them in the points they had wanted, so they'll definitely be looking to extract more in Belgium. VCAR, both drivers are really in the spotlight here with a potential for the golden ticket, dun-dun-dun, an open Red Bull seat, potentially. (laughs) Daniel does not have a seat announced yet for next year. As a reminder, Yuki did sign an extension with VCAR, but you never know. They're all the same family. (laughs) For Alpine, two horrible weekends in a row for Gasly with mechanical DNFs. Hopefully they can pull together a strong result before the break, which would help with morale, I think, heading into vacation. For Stake, still the only team with no points, but we are patiently waiting and always cautiously optimistic that that will happen this season. For Haas, it was no points this weekend for the Hulk, so hopefully we'll see if our reigning king of the midfield can head into summer break on a high. And as we were saying, all eyes are now on who will take that second seat to pair with Ollie Berman next year. And then for Williams, no points this weekend, but they have looked stronger in quality the last few races, especially Logan has been doing well in quality. So we will see if they can repeat that and also keep an eye out for any announcements about Logan's seat. Hot take. What do we got? Okay, you guys are going to laugh. This isn't hot per se, (laughs) but I'm going to say Max Verstappen. But in my defense, he has not won since four races ago in Spain. (laughs) I I think that's hot. I think that's hot. I can't believe we're saying that, but I'll I'll give that to you. (laughs) Uh, That's warm, but you can have it. Um, Lukewarm, yeah. (laughs) lukewarm. Mine's Alonso top five. I don't know. I think Aston Martin brought up great last this weekend that didn't work. I hope that they work for Belgium and I, I want to see him back on top a little bit. Alonso hasn't been in the conversation for a little while. That would be fun. Know, bring him back. That's a fun one. I hope that happens for your sake and all of our sakes. Mm-hmm. For me, I'm going to say Ferrari comes back to kick off silly season on a high with a double podium. Very hot, but very hot. I'm um, I felt like saying a Ferrari podium was not hot enough because Carlos did get one in Austria, I think. So with that, 
Uh, that was so fun. I really enjoyed this conversation and I have lots, well, we have lots coming for you this week on Formula E. I really miss Sarah and Chessa this week and there, but lots of stuff coming, a couple F1 factory visits as well. So stay tuned for all of that and we'll chat soon.